Oh, okay. I, Calling hello. Chris Anderson in London. I am. I'm actually in London um, for a little while yet. So yeah, I'm back in the, the, the main studio in Collingwood Buyer. I, it looks vaguely hotel-like, but I'm not sure. I am in a Homewood Suites hotel in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. You lucky uh, guy. Yeah, it's been great. We've had a great trip, a uh, lovely scenery, fantastic, uh, you know, visiting. And it's been uh, really lovely. We're visiting our oh. son in Durango and we're flying out tomorrow morning. Nice. We stayed an extra night just so I could be here for History Happy Hour. Well, and that's, you know, we all appreciate your dedication. Welcome, everybody, to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, offering a variety of history tours in Europe, the U.S., and the Pacific. Check it out at stephenambrosetours.com. And whether you're watching live, watching on replay, or listening on the HHH podcast, yes. thank you for joining us today. We'll be talking about Arctic convoys in World War II with Bletchley Park historian David Kenyon. So I'm looking forward to that. So hey, everybody, I know you're signing in there. Let us know you're here. Let us know what you're drinking and tell us the temperature where you are. Yeah, you're getting a lot of, it's a, cold, it's cold, it's cold. There's a great variety of temperatures, about 40 here in Albuquerque. I'll let other people say what it is there. Chris, who who do we have joining us so far today? Uh, Cassie Picard from uh, Frigid Yet Sunny Boise, Idaho, and Ooh. Susan Yu um, from Maryland. Uh, Ross from Vaseville, California. I hope I did that. pronounce that right. Ken from Frozen, Kansas. Okay, Heather Heather Backus, who says it's five degrees in Colorado, and George Luz, who says that it is uh, cold in New cold. England. George, is what here. a surprise! I'm shocked. <laughs> Good shocked. reporting there, George. Thank you, George. Uh, and uh, by the way, I want to thank everybody who supports us via Patreon, especially our Patreon top shelf supporters. And we have Chris more names on the list this hey, week. Hey, look at that! You see the bar, the right hand column now? Yes. It's dropping down thanks to Gary Peck being there at the top of it. So that's a uh, new welcome, Gary, and welcome everybody else. And thank you everybody who supports us via Patreon at whatever level, uh, and you can do so too by going to Patreon.com/slash. History Happy Hour. That was a cue, Chris. I'll try to get oh, it. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I was watching you just scrolling. HistoryHappyHour.com. Yes, there you go. Thank you. You know, we, we're, <laughs> we're, we're coming up on our fifth anniversary, isn't it? Or for, what is something oh, like God. that? And, yeah. you know, uh, fourth anniversary. Our fourth anniversary. So we should buy, have this we by We should now. know better. Are we ready to go? I think we are. No, but I, I, I'm ready. Okay. Give me a cue. <laughs> What do you think? Do I have the bell or not? I don't know. Do you have the simulating <laughs> bell? Oh, look at that. I'm so happy. The bar is open. The bar is open. What's on it's tap? Ah, oh, well, um, I'm kind of, well, I'm very excited about tonight's show. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, David Kenyon, who is the research historian at Pletchley Park, is joining us. Um, uh, David has worked in film and television and written some terrific books. Uh, amongst them uh, uh, is the book Bletchley Park and D-Day, which I cannot... Uh, say enough good things about it. it's a really fantastic book in fact at some point i'd like to have him back on to talk about that book uh but uh we're here to talk with him about his new book um arctic convoys bletchley park and the war of the seas um so uh we're really looking forward to this one as well so that's what's on tap welcome david kenyon good evening hey uh, welcome did did you bring a drink to history happy hour of course <laughs> 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 Excellent. Get through it somehow. Let's get through it somehow. What are you drinking, Mr. Anderson? Oh, I just I'm I'm recovering from the weekend, so it's just water tonight. But all right, I well I'm my best to because support. it's the yeah. only thing within miles, I think. But anyway, <laughs> start, us, start us off, Chris. Okay. Um, you say, David, uh, at the start of the book, you say a good deal of ink has been spilled uh, on the story of the Arctic convoys in the past. Um, and uh, when we were talking before the show, you said you only like to write books where you can say something new about a topic. So given what has been said about this, what made you say there's something missing, something that I can add to the conversation? Well, one of the joys of Bletchley Park or being looking into the history of Bletchley Park is that inevitably a good deal of it was secret for a very long time. So the first releases of anything to do with the Codebreakers' work 
uh, was in 1977, or there was a book written in 1975, and then 1977, they, um, the, the government started releasing material. So a great deal of ink was uh, expended on the Second World War prior to 1977. And even after that, material on the, the SIGINT side of the story was released relatively slowly by the British government. And that process didn't finish until the last couple of years. There was a major release in 2018, for example. So mm -hmm. there has been a, a slow drip of new material and it's been a lot of that, even if it's been in the archive for 10 years, in many cases, nobody's actually got around to reading it. So there are fresh stories to tell uh, from the intelligence point of view about mm -hmm. World War II, even on what feel like familiar topics. And sometimes you, you, once you get into the SIGINT story, mm -hmm. and I, you probably appreciate this from my D-Day book, you wonder how people managed to write a book about it without mentioning all yeah. this, because it yeah. had to be so crucial. So um, maybe we can step back and you can give us an overview of the this fight that's uh, covered in your book, uh, the Arctic convoys. Where are these convoys going from and to and what's each side fighting for? And at the appropriate moment in your answer, I can bring up the map and people can study it a bit as you're uh, as you're talking about that. Right. Well, um, I'm sure most of your learned listeners will be aware that uh, Hitler invades Russia in June 1941, and the Soviet Union becomes uh, a rather reluctant ally of Great Britain and, uh, well, not the United States at that point, because they're not in the war either yet, mm. but uh, they will be. Um, and there is pressure on the British government and on Churchill, sort of from day one, from the Russians, to support them materially. Uh, especially after the massive defeats of the early days of June and July 1941. So uh, the British institute a, uh, a policy of supplying Russia with war material, uh, both weapons and equipment, but also raw materials, food, all sorts of bits and bobs. And one way to get that from the UK to the Soviet Union is round the top of Norway to either Murmansk or Archangel, which you can see on the right-hand side of that map, you can see Murmansk up near the Finnish and Norwegian borders and Archangel further south. Um, the problem with Archangel, even though it's further south, you can see the White Sea there freezes in the winter. So that is only, Archangel is only accessible in the summer, but Murmansk is, available, is accessible all year round. And from August 1941, right up until May 1945, uh, the last convoy actually arrives after the war is finished. Uh, Britain sends regular convoys of material around the top end of Norway, past the North Cape, you can see there, to these Russian ports. And then the ships have to sail back again. And uh, the latter part of the campaign, convoys are coming from the United States and they sail to the ports in Iceland, Reykjavik and Akureyri. And then they join convoys from Iceland that go to Russia as well. So uh, enormous quantities of stuff being shipped to the Russians. And that's a quarter of what they get. What people, the, the Arctic convoys are famous. What are less famous are there were also US convoys direct from the US West Coast from Portland to um, Vladivostok. And material was also sent around via the Persian Gulf and by railway across what is now Iran. And actually, three quarters of the material goes that way. But the, the quarter that goes around the top of Iceland, uh, 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 Norway, rather, are the, the famous bit and the bit that the book is about. Yeah. So so you say that, that there's a certain mythology about these convoys. Um, what would that mythology be? And, and you know, what... Well, there is a... The, there's a mythology about the, the convoy wars across the board in the Second World War. Uh, the Battle of the Atlantic is extremely well known, uh, but also there is a, a, a popular version of the Battle of the Atlantic, which is not perhaps completely accurate. And this is partly because Churchill, even at the time, built up the, the U-boat threat to be something incredibly significant and terrifying. And he did this because, for political reasons, because he wanted to... Um, initially persuade the US to join the war, and then once it had done, keep it in the war. And 
So there is a. It, it, this is slightly awkward because these campaigns, if you're on a merchant ship, they are extremely grim experiences. A great yeah. many lives are lost, but some sometimes the, the the peril can be exaggerated. But the other thing that's characteristic of these stories is people think of it as one side, the Allied side is is merchant ships, relatively small and relatively incapable escort vessels from the navies the US Canadian and British navies, all the navy, versus these all conquering U-boats. And the U-boats get portrayed as these kind of instruments of death that can kind of descend upon you at any moment and do more or less what they like. Uh, U-boats are, contemporary scholarship is showing that U-boats are actually a lot less capable than people have given them credit for. Hmm. And in the Atlantic, it is fair to say, or a lot of modern scholars would say, that the suggestion that Britain was ever going to be knocked out of the war by the U-boats is an exaggeration. Mm -hmm. um, as a friend, scholar friend of mine put it, you don't have to count, you, you shouldn't count the ships that are sunk, you should count the ships that get through, because they're the ones that matter. Right. And actually, the volume of material that arrives means that Britain's never actually going to lose the war, certainly not in the Atlantic. So uh, a, a big part of your book uh, concerns signal intelligence, which makes sense since you're the historian at Bletchley Park. So maybe we can um, uh, talk a little bit about how that enters into the, the kind of the, the story uh, and what is the importance of, of the code breaking efforts. Uh, and I know, I mean, you wrote a book about this, so how is, you know, it's hard to answer <laughs> in a short, uh, well, a short yes, response, but kind of give us a sense of what's the importance of signal intelligence? What, what, what kind of uh, role does it play? It plays in the Arctic. It plays a really fundamental role a simple, and it also plays a, a very key role in the, in the Atlantic um, battles. Essentially the German Navy has to control its surface ships and submarines and its, its, its massive U-boat fleet by wireless. They have to send radio signals to tell everybody what to do. Those signals, uh, I spend a lot of time talking about Bletchley Park and saying to people, it's not all about Enigma. Bletchley Park does all sorts of other things. Actually, in this case, it is very specifically about Enigma. Enigma is the German, um, many of your listeners will know, the German cipher machine that is used to encrypt a huge proportion of their military traffic. The Kriegsmarine the German Navy have a particular version of the Enigma machine that they use on pretty much all of their ships right down to even some of the smallest ones. So when the German Navy is talking amongst itself, they are talking using Enigma encrypted wireless messages. And Bletchley Park famously from the summer of 1941 are able to break into that traffic and to relatively routinely decipher naval enigma messages. And so, uh, and coincidentally, that break into naval enigma happens at about the same time that the Arctic convoy starts. So more or less from day one in the Arctic, naval section at Bletchley Park is able to hear and decipher German message traffic in the theater of war. The Germans are actually able to hear and decipher a good deal of the allied message traffic in the theater of war as well. So it's by no means a one-sided game. Both sides are listening to each other's messages and both sides are reading each other's messages with reasonable success. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. But yeah, it's needed. Um, well, we so um, um, one of the people we hear a lot about when it comes to Bletchley Park is um, Alan Turing. In fact, if you watch the movie about Bletchley Park, you would think that he personally broke all the codes and personally built the uh, the uh, computer, the, the first bomb himself, and, you know, did a lot of other things all by himself or with half a dozen other people. Uh, of course, there's 10,000 or so people who are involved in this. But there's another name that comes up in your book uh, that I think few of our audience know about and probably should, which is a gentleman named Frank Birch, who I guess was head of the German naval section at Bletchley starting in August 1941. And can you tell us a little bit about him and his role in all of this? Frank Birch is, is absolutely critical to this campaign. Um, that's him looking um, more distinguished than, than usual in some respects. Uh, Frank Birch, it's fair to say that Alan Turing was instrumental in the breaking of Naval Enigma. However, from 1942, late 42, Turing goes on to do work on other projects, 
and ultimately leaves Bletchley Park. Hut 8, which breaks Enigma, all they do is produce the raw transcript of the, the German words that were included in the message. And that isn't by any means the end of the process. What happens then is those messages go to Naval Section, which is run by Frank Birch, and he was head of German Naval Section in particular before he took over the whole outfit. And the job of Naval Section is to turn all of the uh, garbled, abbreviation-filled, uh, partial, misunderstood traffic that they intercept and turn that into actual actionable intelligence. And they sit between the raw decrypts in Hut 8 and what you've just seen is a teleprinted product, the finished message, which would be sent to the Admiralty in London. And uh, that process of turning, because if you get a, a basic Enigma message and all you do is decrypt it, well, firstly, it's in German. Secondly, it's in five letter groups. Thirdly, it contains all sorts of abbreviations and other technical language. However, in the course of passing through naval section, it is turned into an English translation with grid references resolved, with technical language resolved and everything else. What this means is uh, the OIC at the Admiralty is receiving uh, a regular flow of fully interpreted, uh, meaningful versions of German message traffic. And what that allows them to do is it allows them to, to fight the war from, from London based on those messages. And interesting, are, are you, I don't know what, whether you two are film buffs, are you familiar with the, the film Sink the Bismarck? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. With, uh, the lovely Dana Winter. And um, I can't remember who's the, who's the, who's the guy in it. I um, can't remember. Well, Edward anyway, Romero is in it too as well. So a, a large portion of the film takes place in the operational, the Admiralty's Operational Intelligence Centre, which uh, if you ever watch Trooping the Colour, the big concrete building on the corner of Horse Guards mm -hmm. is the Citadel and in the basement of the Citadel is, is the Operational Intelligence Centre. And basically what happens there is, and rather as well depicted in the film, they have plots of the oceans of the world and they have pins representing ships and they they fight the war on those maps. And huge proportion of the information that they, they pin onto the maps comes directly from signals intelligence. It's uh, the fact that Bletchley Park can hear German U-boat command talking to the U-boats. They can hear the U-boats talking back to the command. They can hear the U-boats talking to each other. They can hear German reconnaissance aircraft reporting from um, the air over the, the battle area. And they can also hear chatter from the from the ports about what the German surface navy might be doing. It means you can build up a very detailed picture of what your enemy might might or might not be doing. However, that's the simplified version. It's actually a lot more complicated than that. And the the devil is always in the detail with these things. And what I think makes the story interesting as a as a historian is that it's not it's simply not that straightforward. It's a much more complicated process prone to all sorts of error and delay and misinterpretation and one thing or another. Uh, and so most of the players, both on land and sea on all sides, are working most of the time on partial information, guesswork, out of date information. Yeah. And so it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a Bletchley Park myth that you break Enigma messages and your life is then easy because you know exactly what's happening. Yeah. In many cases, all you get is sort of hints and tips as to what might be happening or what happened three days ago or things like that. So it's it's a much more difficult process. Well, so I mean, the other thing you have to remember is um, the Arctic is a particularly hostile place in which to try and fight a sea battle. Um, for the half half of the year, it's dark, so you can't see anything. Uh, it's very difficult to navigate, so you rarely know where you are because taking star shots is very difficult because of the weather, and compasses don't work brilliantly because they all point downwards to the centre of the Earth at that point. So you have a lot of ships sailing around who have only the dimmest <laughs> notion of where they are themselves. They certainly don't know where anybody else is, and certainly for the home fleet, the Royal Navy ships that are out there and the convoys, they're all working under radio silence. So... For the Admiralty to try and run the war, they have to send messages 
based on their understanding of the battle. And actually, the, the picture of their own forces, in some cases, is derived from German messages. Because they don't know where the convoy is, because they, they know the convoy's scheduled route, but they don't know what progress it's made, because it never sends any radio messages, because it can't, because it would be... The, the Germans would use wireless direction finding and pick up its location. So, And similarly, at the moment, uh, Admiral Fraser sails out of scapper flow with the home fleet he can't signal to anybody either so you have this weird situation that um dudley pound for example when he's first sea lord in in the admiralty he's trying to sort of play a game of chess where he he doesn't know where any of his pieces are and he's having to send instructions to his admirals to say do this or do that or make your own judgment based on very very little information so the fact that anybody manages to find anybody else at all or fight any battles is actually largely down to luck. So, so I mean, David, maybe you could help us then. I've always, one of the things that you know, I get on all my tours and I'll, I'll, I'll say something about a particular battle and they'll say, say, well, couldn't we read the German codes? Didn't we break all their codes? So we should know. Um, and, and you've touched on this already. It's a much more complex process. Um, to do something with this information, but maybe uh, kind of to drive that now home, give us an example of sort of the life of, of one piece of intelligence. How does, when you, from the time they get a message, what happens? And if you want to use, you know, one convoy as a concrete example of that, that's, yeah. you know. Well, the one of the great misapprehensions about Enigma is that it's a it's a system that you you break once and then once you've broken it your life is easy because you then carry on reading messages the fact about enigma is the the system how the machine works is known to everybody before the war even starts the, the system itself is not secret <coughs> uh, the british actually bought a couple of machi enigma machines in 1926 so they were fairly familiar with the technology but exactly the same way that the encryption systems work on your phone today the system itself is in the public domain, but each message is sent with a unique key. Um, nowadays, that's a very, very long binary number. Um, and Enigma is the same. Every message was sent with a unique message key, and that's where the secrecy lies. That message key is derived from two things. Uh, the first, well, there are many, many different settings on the Enigma machine. You can swap bits of it around. You put plugs in in different places and exchange the rotors around and one thing or another. And all of those settings change. Uh, well, normally for the Army and the Air Force, they change daily. For the Navy, it's slightly more complicated. And then within that, that daily setting, there is the final positioning of the wheels of the machine, which is done message by message. It's called the message setting. The German Navy... They change every noon in Germany, every day, they change, on the first of the month, they change all of the settings of the machine. On the second of the month, they change only about half of the settings. They change what called the outer settings, the plug board and some other bits of board. Um, and then on the third day, they change all of them again. And within that, each message, individual message is sent with a unique um, starting setting for the rotors. So what this means is at Bletchley Park, every day you have to re-break Enigma. You have to find the key of the day for each of the networks that the Germans are using. Fortunately for the Arctic, the Germans are mainly using a single Enigma network called Heimisch, which Bletchley Park code name is Dolphin. Um, but you have to break Dolphin every day. So what that would mean is come midday in Germany, which would be 10 a.m., uh, Zulu time, GMT, uh, your messages will become unreadable. What you then have to do is you have to identify a message that you can guess the content of. It's called a crib. Uh, whether messages are good for that, anything stereotyped that you can guess what they might be saying. You then have to run a bomb machine run with that crib to get the daily settings. And then from the daily settings, you then have to work out the individual message settings. So what that means is on the first of the month, the Germans will change their key at noon. It will take Bletchley Park eight to 12 hours to read anything at all. Then once they've got the key of the day, they can read stuff incre increasingly 
contemporaneously for the next for the rest of the 24 hours and then at 10 o'clock the following morning there'll be another change and they will be blacked out again and then they have to re-establish what the settings are and get back in again so you get this sort of boom and bust cycle of their some portions of the day and it's because it's a two-day system it's some portions of some portions of one day and bigger portions of the next day they can't they can't read anything at all and then they can read it all and then they can't read it again and so you when when messages are sent becomes particularly critical in relation to this key cycle uh because it it me it makes the difference between a message being read in a couple of hours and thus tactically relevant to only being read the following day and thus potentially being a lot less relevant i mean these mm -hmm. things don't go completely don't become completely useless um they obviously but they don't age terribly well no. so, we so it's this constant cycle of trying to keep up with the German key changes. And if you, what you then do is once you've broken it, you then have to translate it, understand it. And if you, if you put that message back up that I, I sent you, this is a great oh, example. Uh, yeah, hang on, sorry. I was, uh, you know, dreaming. If we look at this message, um, a few, a few interesting things to look at. Right in the middle, you will see T-O-O, -O, time of origin. That is when the German officer, in this case, Admiral Commanding Northern Waters, that's when he wrote the message. Above that to the right, you'll see TOI, and that is time of intercept. That is the, the moment when the message was committed to the ether and somebody in a Y station in probably Scarborough heard it and wrote it down for the British. And you can see there there's 0949 is 949 in the morning on the 30th of April, 1942. You'll see that the time it was the time of origin is actually 1128 that's because the time of origin is in german time which is two hours ahead of the british time so it was it was written at 28 minutes past nine british time it was transmitted at 49 minutes past nine british time and then if you go to the bottom of the page you'll see 12 30 1 5 42. at 12 30 1st of may that is when the message that you can see on this piece of paper was actually teleprinted to the Admiralty. So you can see a delay there between 0949 on the 30th of April and 1230 on the 1st of May. That is how long it took them to decipher this message, or oh, not only decipher it, but translate it and work it through the whole Bletchley Park process. So what you can see there is this, the, these timings become very interesting when you're analyzing the battles, because you can see when the Germans are communicating amongst themselves and just how fast that information makes its way through the chain uh, to the pe people on the Allied side who need to read it. If you just pop it up for another second, sure. another interesting fact about it, the code at the top says ZTPG 46084. ZTPG is the code that Bletchley Park gave to uh, dolphin messages in the, in the Arctic. Z is for Z traffic, which means Enigma. TP is teleprinter. G is German. And uh, you get a sense of the operation when I tell you that on the 15th of May, 1941, uh, ZTPG1 was sent. That's May 41. And on the 5th of May, 1945, uh, what's that, nearly four years later, ZTPG 369,189 was sent. <laughs> Jeez. And that message there is message 46,028. So you can see just how much of this stuff has been generated. Well, and so there has to be a, I mean, you, you ha you've talked about the whole timing involved in getting it to the Admiralty, but then there's also got to be people trying to read these messages and then figure out what they're telling us about where their ships are and then how they can condense that or 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 package that Absolutely. in order to be able to pass it on to the the admirals in charge of the fleet i mean there's a lot of places here where things can go wrong and and they do sometimes absolutely and as the, in, the other thing is yeah. there is there's is a relative lack of consistency because the admiralty can do three things they can look at the intelligence and share it with the commander in the at sea and just leave him to it let him make his own judgment they can share the intelligence with him and tell him what to do on the basis of it. Or they can simply tell him what to do without sharing the intelligence. And at different times in the campaign, they do all these things. And they, there's not necessarily consistency. And you can end up with a situation where 
the message they send to the Admiralty, they haven't backed up with this sufficient intelligence so that it's open to misinterpretation at his end because he doesn't have the backstory to what they've told him to do um, because he hasn't read the rest of the messages. Of course, the, so sending them out to sea is, is inherently insecure. You have to re-encipher them with British, a uh, special British code, and then the guy at the other, the Admiralty, the guy at the other end has to receive. Also, this stuff is only allowed to be shared with officers of flag rank. And a convoy commodore is not of flag rank, so he can't see it. Similarly, a destroyer escort flotilla leader is not of flag rank, so he can't see it either. It's only home fleet admiral and typically cruiser commanders, Admiral Burroughs, who's commanding the cruisers. Um, who are of sufficient rank to actually have the ultra shared with them. So there's a there's there's as you say, there's huge opportunity for misunderstanding, confusion, and delay. It's still extraordinarily helpful, but it's it's not it's not as simple as we've read the ger what the Germans are doing, here's what you need to do. Chris? So so one of the other things that um again it seems obvious, but I think is often overlooked is that the Germans are doing the same things to the Allies. Uh, and so could you talk a little bit about German um, SIGINT efforts? Uh, and in particular, there's a, a man, uh, Wilhelm Turnau, uh, who's sort of interesting that maybe you could talk a little bit about. Wilhelm Turnau is, 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 a, is a really fascinating character. He's the, the mistake that people make is they think that there are that the Germans lack cryptological expertise. They, they, they have a lot, just as many clever people as British do. Or the, and the Americans, but they organize them less well. Wilhelm Tranoff is, is a his background is during the First World War, he was a wireless clerk on a German ship. And he was he forwarded a message from the Admiral of the group he was in to one of the ships in the fleet. He was a sort of intermediate station for the transmission of this message, this enciphered message. And uh, he got a grumpy note back from the ship he'd forwarded the message onto saying, this message makes no sense. It's completely garbled. And he went, oh, well. Um, and because he had some time on his hands, he, he started looking at the message and uh, broke the cipher it was in. And so he, he called his boss and went, uh, I figured this message out. I've broken the cipher. And in typical bureaucratic fashion, the German Navy were extremely annoyed by this and were, you know, he was about to get disciplined when somebody slightly more imaginative went, well, maybe instead of throwing him out of the Navy, we should transfer him to the crypto department. And so he went off to break Allied codes during World War I. And then when the German Navy was uh, massively reduced during the interwar period, he managed to survive by becoming a civilian because the German Navy was limited to how many people in uniform it was allowed to have. And he, he carries on breaking British systems in particular during the 20s and 30s. And then when Hitler comes to power and the Kriegsmarine starts to grow again, his department, uh, the Beobachtungsdienst, the Beydienst, as it's called, is um, grows again into a very significant code-breaking operation. And they are pretty effective at reading a huge number of British naval systems and American and Canadian naval systems as well right up until probably the spring of 1943. So certainly for the first half of the Arctic campaign, the Germans are able to read some convoy traffic, allied convoy traffic, as well as um, us reading German traffic. So you do see in on the German side of the story that they are gaining information from their own crypto. Um, so it's... Uh, so um, jumping in, uh, I want to remind everybody, first of all, that we're talking with David Kenyon, who is the author of Arctic Convoys, Bletchley Park, and the War for the Seas. So one of the things that surprised me reading your book, um, and I'm not particularly knowledgeable about the, the naval battles in uh, World War II, was, I mean, I always thought of the, the, the convoys, the Arctic convoys as, well, here we're sending up these convoys and they're accompanied by destroyers and there are submarines who are uh, in the way and they're shooting at them and that's sort of the main thing that's involved. But the picture you paint is really different. It's, a, it's there, there are aircraft carriers and battleships and battle cruisers and cruisers and destroyers and submarines. I mean, there's, there's really 
it's different sets of forces at different times and they don't always exactly come to grips, but it's really two you know, naval armadas sort of going at it and, and, and trying to modify their tactics after each convoy to, to see how they can improve what they're doing. I mean, it's quite a spectacle, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's, I, I talk about it being three dimensional. It's a subsurface campaign. It's a surface campaign and it's an air campaign. And what dif differentiates it from the Atlantic is that after, probably after Bismarck, I mean, Scharnhorst manages an excursion in 42, but the German surface Navy doesn't really have much of an impact in the Atlantic after Bismarck is sunk. And German air power can't reach the Atlantic in any meaningful way. So basically the only tool that the Germans disposal is U-boats. Is in the Arctic, however, and in the Mediterranean, which is a very similar theater, you have the opportunity to use in the Arctic, the German surface fleet right up to big battleships. I mean, Tirpitz is, is in the Arctic. Uh, in the Mediterranean, they have the Italian surface fleet. And they also have land-based air power. And land-based air power is really, really powerful in naval warfare. Um, the, the British do, don't have a good experience with land-based naval air power. I mean, you, you look at the sinking of uh, Prince Wales and Repulse in um, the Far East. Uh, battleships, bit large warships are extremely vulnerable to air power. Um, so, so it makes the the the, 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 um, the battle space, to use the modern parlance, much more complicated than it would otherwise be. And if you go back to our to our map, I can talk about some of the, the particular concerns. Essentially, the convoys are, are sailing from east to west, from left to right, more or less from Iceland across to the Russian ports. And the German Navy has, for mo most of the campaign heavy units, so Tirpitz, Scharnhorst, um, Hipper, Lutzow, big battleships and cruisers, all up along that sort of from Narvik north to, up to the North Cape, up to Altenfjord. You can see Altenfjord just south of the North Cape. And those battleships and cruisers are capable of sailing the gap from there to Bear Island, which you can see just north of there. That's only a 270 mile gap. It's a very small bit of water. So that gap can be covered very successfully by German air power and those German ships can nip out and attack a convoy in that gap especially in winter when the ice sheet comes right down below Bear Island so the gap gets even narrower and if a convoy if, if, if a German capital ship got amongst a convoy it would destroy it very very quickly but what the British have to do is they sail what they call a covering force from Scapa Flow, which you can see down in the left there, or from Iceland. Typically, they'll send a battleship, a couple of cruisers, an aircraft a fleet carrier if they've got one. And the idea of that force is it sort of hovers to the west of the convoy and is waiting to see whether any German battleships or German heavy units actually sail out of Norway to attack the convoy. And so long as those German ships stay in the fields, the Allied ships, because there's American battleships involved as well, those American ships, British and American ships, will stay out to the west and not get involved. And so the critical role of Bletchley Park in all of this is to be able to tell the Admiral at sea commanding that covering force where the, what the German battleships are doing. And this is another interesting aspect of the, of the SIGINT, that the messages you might be receiving don't, you don't get a message that says, oh, Tirpitz sailed at five o'clock or Tirpitz is going to sail tomorrow morning. What you get is a lot more pattern of life information, messages that might relate to mine sweeping in the relevant fjord or the preparation of air cover for a sortie or something like that. So there's all these different messages that don't explicitly tell you what you want. But if you know the German pattern of operations, you, could, you can pick from these hints what's going on. I mean, the, the very basic one is when Tirpitz is in harbour, nobody sends a wireless message to Tirpitz because they plug a radio uh, a telephone wire into the ship and the Admiral can talk to Berlin on the telephone. But the moment you see a, a message addressed to the Admiral aboard Tirpitz, you know Tirpitz is no longer tied up to the dock. So that's, that's a trigger to know that she's potentially at sea. So there's all these nuances to the traffic. And this famous story of PQ-17, convoy in July 1942 that is... Um, two thirds of the ships are sunk, it's more or less destroyed. 
Uh, the problem there is Dudley Pound, who's first sea lord and in charge of the operation. The convoy's sailing along, and he he knows that if Tirpitz sails from Norway and gets into the convoy, it will destroy it. And the only defence against that is to, the, the technical term is scatter the convoy and let the ships disperse over the sea and make their way independently to Russia. The problem with a dispersed convoy is it's hope, hopelessly vulnerable to air and submarine attack because the escorts can't protect the individual merchant ship. So they get to the critical point somewhere near south of Bear Island where the convoy is heading eastwards. And Pound is saying to his advisors in the Operational Intelligence Centre, who are in turn being advised by Bletchley, he's saying, has Tirpitz sailed? Has Tirpitz sailed? And on that day, the response he gets is, well, the, the key change was at 10 o'clock this morning. We don't know what Tirpitz is doing at the moment, but we will know by about 8 o'clock tonight, which is when the first messages are likely to be, start being broken. And Pound goes into a meeting with his um, advisors at about eight o'clock that evening. And at that point, he says to, he says to um, the guys in OIC, the intelligence people, has Turpit sailed? Can you definitively tell me that she, she, is, she has not left the field? And they say, well, we can't tell you definitively. All of our sort of spider senses of having reading this traffic for the last three years is that we haven't seen the kind of messages that we would expect to see if she had put to sea. So our guess is that she's still in harbour. But Pound says, no, that's not good enough. That's not, that's not sure enough for me. And so he decides to scatter the convoy. Actually, the intelligence guys were right. Tirpitz was still in the field. And the rest is history. The, 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 the convoy scattered. And there's, there's these rather, um, there's a very moving description from uh, Jack Broom, who was commanding the destroyer escort of the convoy, that he, at about seven o'clock that evening, reverses course and strips all his destroyers away from the convoy. And he has a talk to the, the convoy commodore, who's a merchant captain who's in charge of the whole convoy, in the civilian part of the convoy, and kind of says, you know, goodbye and good luck. And he thinks at that point that his destroyers are going to go and take on Tirpitz and will probably die in the attempt. And the convoy commanders know that they've now got to get to Russia completely unescorted. So it's, it's a very powerful moment. Um, and in fact, it, it's one of those ones, Admiral Pound, sadly, he, he was suffering from a brain tumour anyway, and he died uh, in the autumn of 1942. So he wasn't a well man. Uh, but people tend to say that he, he made the wrong decision. He, he, he chose to scatter the convoy when Tirpitz was still in the field. Actually, Tirpitz sails the following morning, and arguably had the convoy still been in being on the 5th of July, Tirpitz would probably have sunk it. So he's kind of damned if he doesn't, damned if he doesn't. But in the event, the decision he took, and this is this is what makes the whole story interesting, is people are confronted with these this partial information and these real life and death decisions that they have to make on both sides. The Germans are in the same situation. They they're kind of can we afford to put our ships to sea to attack a convoy if we don't know where the home fleet is? I mean, the sinking of the Scharnhorst, which we just had the anniversary of on. Boxing Day this year, or 26th of December, uh, 26th of December, 1943. Uh, problem there is the Germans try and send Scharnhorst out to attack a convoy, hoping that the home fleet covering force, the Royal Navy, is far enough away that Scharnhorst can get up, beat up the convoy and come back to Norway without getting attacked. Actually, they've misjudged it. And they get caught first by a force of British cruisers uh, including HMS Belfast, the one that's preserved on the Thames in London, mm. uh, and subsequently by HMS Duke of York and Admiral Fraser and Tirpitz, uh, and sorry, Scharnhorst is sunk as a consequence. So there's there's a lot of risk on the German side as well mm. if they if they screw up these operations. So so David, are the are the people that work at Bletchley are they aware of? Um, Kind of the part that they're playing in this and i mean i know when i when i was reading your d-day book they said a lot of the people that were working there it was just it had become so industrial that they didn't even they, they didn't know the impact of what they were doing necessarily it's, is that the case with true. the naval most of the people who 
are involved in the code breaking process. The people who are running the bomb machines, people who are running the type X's, the, the, the huge numbers of those staff have no idea what's going on. They, 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 the only in inkling they get in what's happening in the war is what they read in the paper. Mm. There are a few people at, at significant points who have a bigger picture. One of the stories that intrigues me particularly is that in Block A at Bletchley Park, at the, big play building, the, um, the downstairs in that picture, either side of the door, was uh, from 1942. That was a plotting room. And there were female Royal Naval personnel, Wrens as they were called, uh, in that room with big wall maps. And they're literally putting in pins where U-boats are. And they can see the war at sea very directly on the map. And we have veteran accounts from some of those women saying that they would they would watch what one lady described as the little pink caterpillars of thread of the convoys creeping along. And they would be gradually putting in more and more pins representing U-boat wolf packs. And to be watching that situation unfold on your wall, but have no agency in it at all. They, 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 there was nothing they could do about it. They just had to watch it happen. So they are one of this very small minority of people who know what's actually going on. Similarly, though, that the, the, the people who wrote those teleprints I, I showed you for the Battle of the Sinking of the Charn Horse, there's a lady who we interviewed who was an RAF um, teleprinter operator in naval section and she was that that christmas of 43 she was on night duty sending those teleprints so she was seeing message she wasn't actually on duty on the 25th when the message came in there's a message from the captain of the channel saying we will we will fight to the last shell you know long live the fuhrer mm -hmm. and somebody in naval section would have had the job of of typing that up and sending it to the admiralty more or less that night so the vast majority of people don't know anything at all. I mean, the contrast is the, the Hollerith section where they have these punch card machines we used for cryptanalysis. Uh, the women down there work very hard, but they have more or less no understanding of what they're doing. It doesn't even mm. make sense to them very much, but they, they know what their job is, but exactly how it influences a big picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so a couple oh. were very surprised when, after the sinking of the Scharnhorst, um, Admiral Fraser turns up and kind of walks in and goes, well done, ladies, you contributed to the sinking of the German battleship. And they're all they're all very pleased, but they're also slightly surprised because they're like, "How does what we do with the cardboard possibly influence the war at sea?" Um, and it's only sort of with hindsight that they uh, they actually find out. You mentioned uh, uh, the Führer a moment ago. I mentioned Adolf Hitler, and I wonder what role he plays in all of this because he kind of keeps the especially the big ships of the German Navy uh, under his thumb a bit, and I wonder. Does he play a role? Uh, uh, is 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 his involvement uh, critical at any point in this fight? It's he casts a, a kind of a malign shadow over the whole thing throughout, and he he has this this almost impossible to um, to resolve uh, conflict between. He insists that uh, his navy is incredibly capable, and he at one point in 1941, 42, he uses the phrase, "Any ship, any battleship that's not in Norway is in the wrong place," and he insists on moving a huge proportion of the surviving German navy up to Norway. But when they get there, he says, "You must no account on no account lose any of these ships," and so it's very hard for the German commanders to fight an effective campaign when they are absolutely prohibited from taking any chances. And it's, 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 contra it's in contrast to the Royal Navy, where I think in the Royal Navy, if you, it doesn't matter if you lose your ship, if you lose your ship fighting the enemy, that's usually okay. You know, unless you've done something really egregious, um, engage the enemy more closely is, is the motto. The German Navy, you get these messages, and particularly after the uh, New Year's Eve 1942, 1943, yeah, New Year's Eve, no, the end of 1942, beginning of 1943, there's the Battle of the Barents Sea where uh, Hipper and Lutzow sail out, these two big German cruisers sail out from Norway and find an effectively undefended convoy. But the, the convoy happens to be defended by a very active destroyer captain called, uh, called Sherbrooke. 
And his six destroyers managed to fight off a pocket battleship and a heavy cruiser. Um, simply because the Germans are so <laughs> risk averse that um, they never really engage properly. And once they start taking hits, they just make a run for it because they're too frightened to, to lose their ships. And at that point, uh, it's rather unfortunate because the battle is taking place and a nearby U-boat surfaces and sees gunfire and assumes that it's a convoy being utterly destroyed by Hipper and Lutzow. And he sends a very triumphant wireless message back to Naval Command using the phrase, you know, I can see only red, meaning that there's just burning ships everywhere, which, of course, is completely untrue. And this message goes to Hitler at Brastenburg, and Hitler's initially very happy. And then he spends 24 hours going, tell me about this naval battle, tell me about this naval battle. And eventually, when Lutzow and Hippo arrive back in harbour, they have to admit that they haven't actually sunk anything. Well, they sunk one British minesweeper. <laughs> Hitler completely loses the plot. And at that point, he declares he's going to abolish the surface navy entirely, and that the Germans will only have U-boats, and that all the big guns should be taken off battleships and used for coastal defence. And uh, Admiral Raider, who has been commander, my commander, the cruise up to that point, I just resigns. He goes, you know, I can't work with this. This is madness. And so that's when Dernitz, who's previously been commanding the U-boats, takes over. And a huge proportion, a, a significant proportion of the German fleet uh, is either moved to the Baltic or scrapped. So Dernitz manages to save um, Scharnhorst and Bismarck and Lutzow, I think. Turpitz, yeah. Uh, so, 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 sorry, Turpitz, not Bismarck. <laughs> Same difference. Um, and some destroyers. But, and again, Hitler is going, I've let you keep these ships. Now you've got to show what they're worth, but don't lose them. And Wernitz <laughs> finds himself in the same cleft stick. And so the there is this lack of, sort of lack of commitment. Um, it's okay to lose a couple of U-boats, but you can't lose a battleship in the Arctic. That would be a propaganda disaster. Um, and so, uh, I mean, it, it arguably, had had the British lost a, a major unit, I mean, if, if King George V or Duke of York or something had been sunk up there, it would have been a catastrophic moral blow in the UK, like when the hood is sunk. But uh, it doesn't stop the Royal Navy from getting stuck in. Yeah, I know, but... But do you say you have a quote, um, David, from uh, Clay Blair, who's kind of a an authority on the U-boats and and mm -hmm. and that part of the, the fight? And he said um, uh, the Allies propagandized the Merman's convoys more than could be justified by the results achieved. That seems a somewhat controversial uh, thing to say. Um, do you agree with that? Is that a fair assessment um i mean he it's, it's, he's kind of making two points on the one hand when you say propagandized it's it, the, the, the british churchill's propaganda was on the one hand that it was vital to keeping the russians in the war but on the other hand it was extraordinarily difficult to do and very very costly and unpleasant uh, given that the vast majority of the material sent to Russia is not being sent through the Arctic, he is being slightly, um, I don't know, uh, obtuse there in the sense that it's not, it's not the fundamental supply line to Russia. And actually, the, the losses, while worse, they're about five times worse than they are in the Atlantic, the worses are still, the losses are not unsustainable, uh, if you look at the campaign as a whole. Right. I mean, there is a point in 1942 and in 1943 subsequently where the Admiralty prevails and they say, we can do this in the winter when it's dark, but we can't do it in the summer. If the Germans have any significant air power up in Norway, you can't do it in the summer because the air threat is just too great. After PQ-18 in particular, uh, they realise that, because the Germans don't really do torpedo bombing for a long time because of disputes between, uh, Goering doesn't want bombers wasted on the Navy. So having aircraft carrying torpedoes around is a waste of time as far as he's concerned. And it's only after the Italians have proved that torpedo bombing is actually extremely successful that the Germans 
train up a load of uh, Yonkers 88 crews and start doing torpedo bombing. And their torpedoes are extremely effective against PQ-18, PQ-17, PQ-18. But then they redeploy the whole force back to the Mediterranean again. And so a huge chunk of the air threat that would otherwise have existed in the Arctic goes away. But it's still sufficient, sufficient to force the British and the Americans to suspend convoy operations in the summer. So in the summer of 43, summer of 44, you don't get any convoy. Summer of 44, it's partly because the Navy is away defending D-Day. And so there aren't mm. enough, the own fleet doesn't have enough resources. But it's also because they've recognized that there are only certain conditions under which these operations are really viable. So it's... Uh, so did it make sense? I mean, in the end, as you look at it now, to, to stick with this, because there was this fight where the naval admirals are saying, "Hey, this this really is maybe we should stop doing this completely." And the Churchill and the other uh, political leaders are saying, "No, we have to do this to show our support for Russia." So in the end, you know, um, do, do you have a judgment that you come down on, David? Uh, I I'm gonna I'm gonna plead the fifth on this one in a way because I kind of don't. Um, one of the things that I discussed with the publisher and with some of the peer reviewers and things is, is the political dimension to this story. There is definitely a political dimension to the story. Uh, how much difference does the supply make to the Soviet Union? Would Stalin have reacted differently if we'd suspended the convoys entirely and all of these issues? Um, my interest in this really is from the signals intelligence and and tactical point of view i'm um, my interest is is it is, is it a viable operation of war um the admiralty conclusion in 1945 was that it was and that they they delivered a, a high enough percentage if you deliver 95 percent of your cargoes to their destination that's a, that's a win <laughs> you know that's a success um so the I, I couldn't tell you the, the full answer on the, on the political, the, the greater strategic dimension. And actually, uh, Andy Boyd, he got in touch with me when it be two years ago now, and he said, "Oh, David, I'm thinking of writing a book on the Arctic." And I went, "Oh, blimey, I'm writing a book on the Arctic." <laughs> we had to sort of deconflict, but it became apparent that his his real interest was this the strategic piece was that how does this you know what's the relationship between Churchill and Stalin and where does this fit in and all that that. Bletchley Park really pay, plays no role in that higher political level. Uh, they're not reading Soviet diplomatic traffic in enough detail to really play a part in the strategic discussion. So my my focus in the book is on the well, sort of on the tactical, if you like. But well, and it's a, a trip. I agree with the Admiralty's conclusion that uh, from a operational and tactical point of view uh, the allies win the convoys get through and the cost to the royal navy is acceptable i suppose it's, well, it's not acceptable if you're one of them but um and the cost to the german navy is absolutely huge um so it's from that from that point of view was was it a good idea to what was it reasonable to expect that it would succeed if you did it yes it was and it did succeed it was, it was, in that sense, uh, a naval victory for the Allies. David Kenyon, thank you so much for joining us today. And it is a, a terrific book that you've written, Arctic Convoys, Bletchley Park, and the War for the Seas. Thank lots you, of, David. Lots of new information in there that, uh, that I didn't know. And so we so appreciate your coming on today and sharing that story with us. Well, thank you very much. I'm, gl I'm glad you enjoyed it. All yeah. right. Well, take care. And I know you've got the, uh, the what is it coming up, the anniversary of the Colossus at Bletchley Park? Yes, that's that's on the 18th of this month. And then we'll be doing stuff for D-Day later in the year. Um, well, I might, what I always like to do at the end of these things, um, if people want to visit Bletchley Park, we are open every day except Christmas Day. So come on down. Um, Please do. And, uh, find out more about all these stories. Uh, we also have our podcast so if you want to hear more from me about this stuff the bletchley park podcast when you finish listening to history happy hour of course when you when you finish oh, yeah. <laughs> i think they're leaving start. now for it already <laughs> park. But, uh, yes all right well check that all out and david thank you so much for joining thank us. you david my pleasure
Ah, okay. Uh, we have we have dealt with the Arctic yes. and the and the fighting there. And uh, next week, Chris, we are going to be talking about mm-hmm. the women behind the few, which is the title yes. of the new new book by uh, bring it up by Sarah Louise Miller, uh, and uh, talks about women. Uh, basically, uh, the Women's Auxiliary, Auxiliary Air Force. Wait till I have to say podcast. I'm going to really get in trouble then. Uh, and uh, and their role in the uh, Battle of Britain and the and their role supporting the RAF and kind of again uh, like the story we have today, like a lot something that that was basically kept secret for a long time and we didn't know a lot about that we know a lot more about now. So that is coming up next week. Um, any any final words? No, it's just that I'm looking forward to the show. This was great. We've had a lot of a lot of people interested in saying they, they like the show. I'd encourage you to go uh, to Bletchley Park. And until you get there, I would encourage you to read David's books. You can read so, it on uh, the way there. And we'll be both be, there yeah. in we the week for today. So, uh, and, and hundreds of other people with us. So uh, it should be fun. Uh, Please subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. Shout at us on Twitter. Listen to our podcast. Back us on Patreon. And browse historyhappyhour.com. Thanks, everybody. Be safe. And with a pause, and now.